health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered, and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action. Good afternoon and welcome to Vitals, value, innovation, technology, advocacy, leadership, and service. The tools that top leaders are using to implement change in healthcare delivery and outcomes across our country. Vitals is an open forum to hear from current thought leaders implementing substantive change through the principles of Vitals, to engage them in crucial conversation, to learn through their example, and to energize and empower our healthcare community to solve the nation's biggest healthcare challenges. I'm Dr. John Langell, president of Northeast Ohio Medical University. And today I'm joined by Dr. Art Papier, the co-founder and CEO of Visual DX. Dr. Papier is a national thought leader in clinical and informatics who maintains the overall vision for the company with a keen focus on product integration and impacting costs in healthcare through clinical accuracy. His entrepreneurial drive, years of clinical experience, and passion for delivering true healthcare solutions have propelled the company to the forefront of clinical decision support and quality in innovation. Further, Visual DX has proven to be an important tool for providing more equitable care to all populations. We're also joined today uh, by Ms. Monica Robbins, who is the uh, healthcare leader and correspondent uh, for the Cleveland area. And uh, we, we welcome her back as she will be moderating this session. So without further ado, uh, we welcome uh, Dr. Papier. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Langell, for such a warm introduction. It's truly a, a pleasure to be here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and uh, present some ideas and looking forward to a conversation after the presentation. I'm gonna start with a story about a patient that I saw during a study that we ran at the University of Rochester a number of years ago. This patient was set to be admitted to the hospital and she told us her story that she had two other admissions for the same problem in six months. And this was for the wrong diagnosis. And so, what this patient was being admitted for was a soft tissue infection called cellulitis, and she didn't have cellulitis. Research shows that on average, and this is not only in the United States, it's globally, that 30% of patients that are admitted to hospitals for cellulitis do not have cellulitis and do not need to be admitted to hospitals. What's really important is that these patients receive IV antibiotics for staph and strep infections. These antibiotics put these patients at risk for infections such as C. difficile, which can be life-threatening in itself, also can set them up for a serious drug reaction and obviously cost the healthcare system quite a bit of money. So the problem, one problem we have in healthcare that I've been fascinated about in my career is how enamored we are with things that are new. You know, the, the news and the media captures every new drug development, but we really don't pay attention to what's been broken for decades in healthcare. And I've come to the conclusion that old problems are boring. They're not really newsworthy. 
And usually the old problems are difficult. And so because they're difficult doesn't mean we should ignore them. So this one problem of, of cellulitis diagnostic error, to give you a sense of the scope, there's a half a million admissions in America each year for this problem. You're not gonna be able to get rid of all the error. You're gonna need some false positives to capture all the true positives. But if you could reduce the error rate by 20%, you'd save over 100,000 admissions and over a billion dollars in wasted healthcare dollars. So we're living now in a historic time of the digital age. And we're living from a transition from when I was in medical school of being memory oriented. And really this idea of you put everything in your brain, you didn't have computers to aid decisions. Maybe you had in your white coat, some ball handbooks, the Washington manual, some index cards. But by and large, you're attending model this idea of roundsmanship, that your attending was this all-knowing oracle to just uh, amaze you with their feats of memory and, and clinical acumen. And they would hide doubt from the patient. The, the doctor really was that, that Marcus uh, Welby, if people can remember that, some of the people in the room, person, the physician on TV, they just knew it all. But now we're really moving to be more process oriented in this idea of assisted decisions and clinicians and students and residents all have smartphones. And hopefully we're modeling information acquisition and we're being humble and we're able to say to our patients, you know, I can't memorize every adverse event of every medication and medicine. We're gonna to have to look up that adverse event, and I'm gonna share that information with you and we're gonna have a conversation. Well, that's a huge change from just 30 years ago when I was in medical school. You know, now we're, we have a much more collaborative relationship, hopefully with our patients. And so the idea of decision aids is really this field of decision support where we, we have computer-based information that's augmenting our brain. And the, I, the equation is that the brain plus the computer-based information is more powerful than the brain alone. So it's not a man versus machine argument. We're not trying to say that the computer is gonna beat the doctor. We're saying the computer is gonna help the doctor. And this could be you know, machine learning, you know, analysis of images, a field we're working in, or artificial intelligence broadly, or rule-based systems or Bayesian systems, any, any technology that's bringing information in the exam room to the decision-making moment or in the hall of the hospital. So we're developing these technologies to solve problems. And one of the problems that we've been focused on in our work is the problem of diagnostic error. So when you go back to the landmark to errors human study, they really looked at issues like slips and falls in hospitals. Um, surgical wrong site mistakes, dosing errors, sepsis from hand not being washed. There really wasn't any attention on diagnostic error and clinical decision-making in that landmark study over 20 years ago. But the IOM came out with a study in 2015 called Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare and we use that data from that study to create this infographic to say below the waterline of the iceberg is really the mass of a problem around clinical decision making, where we have 18 million diagnostic errors a year with over 74,000 deaths from diagnostic errors. And this has certainly been compounded in the last couple of years where COVID has put this additional pressure on the decision making moment. And you know, incomplete physical exams because clinicians don't want to spend too much time in the exam room and possibly be exposed to COVID or premature closure on the diagnosis being COVID when it's not. So how do doctors think? How did we get to the situation where we need information at our fingertips? Well, doctors think fast and slow. This is a wonderful book by Daniel Kahneman who's a Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, Dr. Kahneman in this book defined the idea of system one 
in system two thinking. And it's very, very easy to explain the differences. System one is also described by Malcolm Gladwell in this book, Blink, where he's saying that experts can size up a situation in a millisecond with the blink of an eye. And so an example would be that. You don't have to think about that. And you don't have to think about this. What is this? You know what it is instantly. So you're not thinking about that. So system one is pattern recognition that's instantaneous. And this to a dermatologist, you look at this and you see the burrows of scabies and you just know it's scabies. And to a dermatologist, you'd go herpes, granuloma annulari, shingles, and stria because you've seen these before and you instantly recognize it. Now, if I said to the audience, what's 17 times 24? If you haven't read Kahneman's book, you probably wouldn't know the answer instantly. It's 408. You have to use your brain to really, you know, maybe do 10 times 24, seven times 24 and add it up, think about it and come up with the answer. In this wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Dr. Kahneman describes how most people will stop walking if they're asked to compute this in their brain because they can't do the automatic activity of walking and compute this at the same time. Likewise, if I said the patients in your exam room, 62 years old, with fever or end-stage renal disease, and I listed 10 different medications, they have reticulate purpura on their skin exam and a history of diabetes, hypertension, in atrial fibrillation, I said, well, what's the diagnosis? What's the differential diagnosis? You'd have to think about it. So that's system two. So we, we move before, between system one and system two in our problem solving. And an important point is not all visuals are system one. These are four different patients with similar rashes that we uh, would call an exanthematous or morbilliform eruption as dermatologists. You know, non-dermatologists might call it a maculopapular eruption, meaning I'm really not sure what the morphology is. But one of these pictures is a picture of a drug reaction. Another picture is a viral eruption. Another is of infectious disease with an exanthematous eruption. So you have to know, did the patient recently take a medication? Did the patient travel? So you have to ask questions and combine it with maybe with the pattern that you're seeing, but not the actual diagnosis because the visual doesn't sing out the diagnosis like some of the other slides I showed where you instantly know that it's scabies because you have embedded in your cortex what that burrow of scabies looks like. So this is these four images are vague and you'd be using system two. So we're shifting back and forth between system one and system two to solve different problems in the exam room. But the problem with system one is also uh, can be affected by bias. And there's many different forms of bias. And there's a uh, kind of biases include premature closure, anchoring bias. Maybe you were told the diagnosis and you didn't reevaluate and you, you've held on and anchored to a prior diagnosis and didn't rethink it. Maybe you were overconfident there's dozens of these described by Dr. Pat Crossgary, who's an ER physician and psychologist that's a leader in this field of, of clinical reasoning. And then system two is, is limited by the capacity of our brain. Like we just can't memorize it all. So premature closure is one of the, the reasons that we see lots of diagnostic error. In that case of cellulitis, certainly many clinicians see a red leg and they prematurely close on cellulitis. And that's been explained as you go to pick out a puppy and you're looking at a litter and the breeder shows you seven puppies and they hand you the first puppy and you just fall in love and you don't look at any other puppies. That's premature closure. And that cognitive bias affects our decision-making. There's also representative bias. And this is one of the cognitive biases that I've been fascinated about in my career, because it touches how we educate medical students and residents. And so the, the example here is a 67 year old woman presents to the emergency department with a toothache and fatigue is triaged to the non-acute side. Well, this is a, a woman having an MI. So A, there's gender bias, because sometimes um, the pro prototypical 
illness script is teaching about a male with a heart attack, not a woman with a heart attack, but presenting not with crushing chest pain and pain down the left arm, but a toothache and fatigue. So a variant presentation of the common causes much, much more harm in medicine than missing really rare diagnosis. And if one thing can change about medical education, we'd start to teach about variation and move away from this model of just teaching to the classic. Well, this is not a variant, but it's been treated like a variant. And by that, I, I mean racial bias in medicine. So diseases present differently on brown skin because redness and purpura on white looks red and purple, but red and purple on brown looks like a dark brown. So this has been a very large problem in medicine, something that I got fascinated about years ago. I published a paper in 2006 called Disparities in Dermatology Educational Resources. And I had a great medical student that went to every textbook and atlas in dermatology and every lecture given at our at our um, national meeting. And we counted the number of images that were dark skin versus light skin and the teaching that was going on. And we showed those racial disparities quite a while ago. And we've been talking about it for 20 years, but it's only in the last two years that people started listening to our argument about the importance of having imagery of disease in patients of color. And this really just underscores how important it is. On the right, a uh, light-skinned patient with palpable purpura, a sign of acute meningococcemia, life-threatening illness. On the left, the same disease. You see how subtle it is in brown skin. So thinking about this problem of like, well, how do we augment decisions and really thinking about what can we load to the brain because we do, we do need to load to the brain critical information like ACLS and many of the routines that are done in the emergency room or in the surgical suite. And, and certainly certain activities can be done from the brain. So the Wright brothers uh, didn't have computers. They, they put their finger in the air and they saw which way the wind was blowing and they pushed that plane into the wind. But you, you can't do that for complex systems. To fly this, you need to augment the brain of the pilot so that you can fly this, take off, fly it, and land it successfully. Well, I'd argue for this, you need to augment the brain. Not only do we need the data flowing from those monitors to see the cardiac rhythm and the blood pressure, but we need to be able to interpret the data. But the, the real question is, what are we doing with this data today? And what, what, what's happening across medicine? What do most physicians use to interpret data? Well, they use this often. I mean, certainly they use up-to-date and they, they look up by disease and up-to-date. But there are many, many clinicians that go to Google and type in clues into Google. And one of the arguments we make is that you wouldn't get on an airplane if your pilot was navigating only with Google, you'd get right off that plane. Pilots have instruments that are designed for flight, yet physicians have a potpourri of instruments. And if you frame medicine from the point of view of aviation, we don't have standards. We have ad hoc search. People search differently. They have different strategies for search. Much of medicine is still memory-based. And really importantly, unlike aviation, we don't have good feedback loops to learn from our crashes. We used to do way more autopsies in this country. We do very, very few autopsies. We don't do enough m and rounds. We certainly don't learn from the mistakes like we should be learning. And crashes often just go totally unrecognized in medicine. And each pilot performs differently. So we have a cockpit for flying and we need a cockpit for medicine and we need to start to set standards. And my, my career has really been dedicated to this idea of like, what, what is the cockpit and how do we use visualization in the cockpit uh, that instead of putting a book online in the exam room when you don't have time to read a book, how do we get information down so that you can use it in 15 seconds or 30 seconds and certainly under a minute 
in the exam room because you, you really need information to be that pithy and that concise. And so what we did is we, we, we took the idea of the diagnostic differential just as a list of words, and we started representing diagnoses that have skin findings with pictures. And then we coined the idea of something we call the symptocon or the symptom icon. So in the upper right is the cubital tunnel syndrome. And I'm not a, a rheumatologist or orthopedic surgeon. I know very little about the cubital tunnel syndrome, but I can tell you in an ulnar distribution, there's hand pain, muscle weakness, numbness, and paresthesias. So rather than giving you a four paragraph summary, I can give you a, a quick visual to explain a diagnosis. And tying this to variation in presentation, we realize that because diagnostic error involves variation of the common, that we had to represent diagnoses in different ways. So on the left, when you search by facial droop and arthralgias, you're gonna get a presentation of Lyme disease without the picture of the rash. And you're gonna be comparing it to a diagnosis like Bell's palsy and other diseases that are in the differential that do not have a rash. But if you search by rash features, you'll get to a, an image of the rash of Lyme disease and comparing to other diseases that are in the differential by comparing pictures. So behind the scenes, we've developed technology that's adapting the results view to accommodate the variation in the way diseases present. So that, that concludes the, the formal presentation. I'm really looking forward to questions and a conversation. Thank you, Dr. Papir, and welcome to uh, everyone who is here with us today. We have 32 participants. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section, and I will go through these and ask. So our fir first question, is coming from Rod. It's crazy to think that there wasn't the inclusion of different skin tones in medical training for disease treatment. What other areas of medical education might be lacking in inclusion? Well, I'm a dermatologist, so we're always talking about rashes, but in medical education, when we do problem-based learning and you're doing a scenario and you show a picture of a patient and you frame it always with a white patient, that's racial bias. And there, I know of one university that they reviewed every lecture by every department. And they, they made sure that when they presented any case of any kind and they were referencing a patient's face or it, even if it wasn't a rash, it's just characterizing the patient. They made sure that all these problem-based learning events in med ed were balanced with light skin and dark skin. And they actually, purposely said we're going to have an image of a patient light skin, mid-tone, and very dark skin. And we're going to make sure that half of the cases start with dark skin and the variant patient is the white skin. Can you talk more about your collaboration with the Skin Atlas and the New England Journal of Medicine? So we, we engaged a wonderful dermatologist at a USC, Nada Albuluk, who runs the Skin of Color Clinic at USC. And she had been using Visual DX for years and looked at and said, we have to do more. And we reached out to the New England Journal of Medicine and the Skin of Color Society. And we created a four part lecture series on racial bias and the skin. And that had 32,000 registrants from over a hundred countries last fall, a year ago. Those are preserved and you can view them without charge on a website called Project Impact. So projectimpact.org is a collaboration of Visual DX, the Skin of Color Society, New England Journal of Medicine, but we have new collaborators, including the American Medical Women's Association and other societies that have said, this is really important to get right. And so this website at projectimpact.org is uh, a reference center on research, publications, medical students are taking the pledge, medical students are getting involved and in looking at how we can do more to really do meaningful activities to reduce racial bias and 
not only in medical education, but in, in clinical care. Do you know the percentage of medical schools now using a diverse skin database? Well, I can only tell you what percentage is using Visual DX. We have about 100 medical schools using Visual DX. There's about 160. So, you know, much of medical education, as I said during the presentation, has been this memory-based paradigm. And we, as a physician-led university-affiliated company, we're trying to teach to how do you use decision technology during medical school, but also use it in the clinics. And it takes time uh, to change the culture of medicine, to change from this idea that you have to memorize to pass your boards and the boards are an open book. That message of memorizing to pass your boards is sending a message to our learners that you can memorize it all. And that's a myth, you can't memorize it all. So if you want it to be a medical educator that believes that your medical students and residents should be accessing the best evidence as they solve problems, then our testing system has to adapt to it. So it's one of the big failures of our system right now is the students are going to work and study to how they're rewarded and they're rewarded for memorization. They're not rewarded for how good of an information acquirer I am and how good am I a, a clinical reasoner based on the information I just acquired. How do we best encourage inclusivity in medical innovation? Great question. I think we need, the innovators need to be um, minorities and people of color need to be entrepreneurs. And so it, it shouldn't be um, people who are privileged just coming up with ideas. And, you know, there are entrepreneurs throughout society um, of all ethnic and racial backgrounds and medicine shouldn't be different. I, and we're in Rochester, New York. We have incredible entrepreneurial community um, and, and it's a diverse community that's, you know, starting new food businesses, but medicine is behind. I mean, medicine is really, when you think about it, it, it is really the last profession to take advantage of digital computing. And, and most of the innovation in medicine has to do with making money. You know, I'm just back from the, the leading digital meeting called Health in Boston, 6,000 attendees in Boston a couple of weeks ago. And the largest digital meeting is called HIMSS, which before COVID would have 40,000 people and a huge exhibit hall a mile long. And when you walk down through that exhibit hall and you look at what the companies are developing, most of it has to do with revenue cycle management, charge capture. It has to do with the business of medicine. There's an incredible opportunity for the students and residents and faculty on this call to start to innovate and develop tools that improve care improve the lives of people. And we're starting to see that. I mean, there, there are, there's much innovation going on that's patient facing because we know that patients are out there thirsty for information. And it's really our job to give them high quality tools. Ne uh, Elliot says, Neomed now has access to Visual DX. What are your suggestions to gain skills in the software? And did you mention CME benefits as well? I did not mention CME. So you do as a practicing physician for every search that you do in Visual DX, you can get a half a credit of CME. And um, for skills, we have complementary problem-based learning sets. So we can have students work through a case and solve it using decision support. We also have a new set of disease summaries where we're showing three images in dark skin and one image in light skin that we could share with educators at uh, Neomed. So we do have a set of complementary tools as well as um, the app, which every student can have on their phone for free. So on the homepage of Visual DX at Neomed, there's a button right in the center of the page below the search box that says, get your mobile app. If you're a student, resident or faculty, click that. You create your username and password. 
you'll go to the App Store or Google Play for Android. You'll download the app for free. You'll plug in that username and password, which you created for free. And then you'll have 45,000 images in your pocket. 14,000 of those images or more will be in skin of color. Since the majority of health professionals have not been trained using such systems, is there anything being done to retrain them? And I'll add to that, uh, is there, are you experiencing any pushback from older physicians? Well, older physicians, many retired as soon as they had to work an electronic record. And those that didn't have been totally frustrated by the electronic record. And so one of the real challenges of working in this field of in medical informatics and digital medical information is the drudgery of the electronic health record. Many of my colleagues who practice full time are at home working two or three hours in the evening on their patient notes. And so that creates enormous challenges for those of us that are trying to improve decisions like diagnosis and testing and treatment decisions because you have to embed inside the electronic record. And so we do that. We can embed Visual DX inside Epic and inside Cerner, but to really get Visual DX working in, in just the seamless way in the record, you have to have the attention of these EHR companies. And these EHR companies are really focused on the imperative billing, billing the patients and making sure charges are captured. So just like the analogy of, you know, you, you end up studying and training based on what the end reward is, which is passing your boards. You end up developing electronic health record systems based on the end reward, which is how the hospital is compensated financially. And so we haven't really designed an electronic record as a patient care system. We've developed an electronic record as a billing system, which is a tragedy. So the reason I'm on this call and the reason Visual DX exists is I have to pay homage to my mentor, Dr. Larry Weed. Larry Weed, most medical students and young physicians don't know that name and they don't know what he invented. What he invented was the problem oriented medical record and the soap note format, subjective objective assessment plan. Before Larry wrote a landmark paper in the New England Journal in the late 1960s, medical records were not only illegible, they had no format, they had no structure. You had no way of knowing what the physical exam findings were on the patient. You had no complete history on the patient. And so what Larry said is that we need to bring structure to the way we evaluate a patient. We need to know their history. We need to know your physical exam. We know, need to know your re reasoning in the assessment. And then we need your plan. And that was the structure that he introduced. And many, many teachers today don't even understand why that was developed and the importance to having structure. The reason pilots don't crash is they have structure, they have checklists. And so now we've introduced in the OR, we've introduced checklists to make sure they were operating on the wrong side of the correct side of the body, not the wrong side of the body. Well, diagnostic reasoning and medical record keeping needs structure so that we, we can bring reliability to our thinking. So we, we at Visual DX really believe in information structure. And we believe that if we're going to change medicine, we need to take this new generation and introduce them to structure. To get back to your question, Monica, it's really hard to change old habits. I'm going to be honest. A physician that's been practicing out of their brain for 25 or 30 years and doesn't look anything up, they may not even look anything up in a book, never mind uh, a handheld device. It's going to be very hard to change that habit. Was there a defining moment in your career that led you in an entrepreneurial direction? Well, I met Larry Weed 
And Larry Weed had left the university. He gave a brown bag lunch to our first year medical student class. And I was sitting in the audience and listened to him um, talk a mile a minute, genius level. And I went to meet with him and he said, you want to meet with me? I'm no longer at the university. I started a company. And I went over to the small little office where his son and one software engineer working on the oldest computers, which hardly had a hard drive back then, um, and talked to Larry. And he said, you know, I've been in academia for 20, 30 years, and it changes too slowly. He said, if you really want to have impact, you have to develop technology that people will embrace. And then you don't, you don't change one or two people, you change everybody because they adapt some technology and you know society shifted with the telephone society shifted with the um, TV and then you know we were having this conversation way before the internet this conversation was uh, probably a decade at least a decade before the internet was discovered so I'm having this conversation with a genius who's saying saying these things to me and I said yeah that makes sense you know that the world pivots after major technological advances. And of course, now the world's pivoted with the digital age. We're living through probably the greatest transformation of society. And unfortunately, over the last few years, we've seen the ill effects of the transformation in terms of disinformation. You know, when the information age started and the internet was founded, no one anticipated how evil bad information could be. And so now we're spending a lot of time just trying to figure out how to undo disinformation that's occurring, that's hurting us in healthcare. I imagine that systemic racism issues in medical training and practice increase the mortality rate for people of color. Why isn't there more outrage and advocacy for change? Well, that's probably beyond the scope of totally my expertise, but I'll, I'll give you my musings on it in terms of the last two years. I mean, we're living through a once in a hundred year pandemic and um, people are anxious, nervous, um, society has been disrupted and we have, and you know, obviously society is fractured right now. We, we're not at the center, we have polarization which has made it really, really hard to move, move ahead in a progressive way. And, you know, out of this major disruption, it's probably gonna take a decade for us at least to figure out how to, to work on these real problems that we need to work on. Can you, can you speak a little more to developing ways to reduce errors in medicine? Identifying an accurate diagnosis is not always based on an exam or visual clues. So what are your thoughts about other ways to support system two or triggering system two to avoid errors? Great question, fantastic question. So how do you know what you don't know? It's one of the hardest questions because um, there's, there's um, a principle called the ETO principle, E-T-T-O. It stands for the efficiency thoroughness trade-off. So on one side, you can be wonderfully efficient and fast, but you can't be thorough. On the other side, you can be wonderfully thorough and detailed, but you're going to be slow. And you can't be wonderfully efficient and wonderfully thorough at the same time. You have to find a sweet spot. So as we problem solve, there are certain problems that we can be hyper efficient at. So you're a pediatrician, you know what otitis media looks like, you can look in the ear, you know what it is. And a lot of the day is some very efficient diagnostic scenarios. And then the patient comes in and said, I've had this problem off and on for years, I've seen 10 doctors, I've had all these lab tests, I'm not getting better. That's not an efficient problem. You have to shift gears to be really thorough, right, at that point. And one of the challenges is, how do you know when somebody um, comes in that you need help? And if you went to the computer all the time, if the computer is not operating in the back time, you're going to be really inefficient because you're looking up things where you don't really need help. So it becomes the Achilles heel of this field is really 
how do you know when you don't know and how do, how do you reach for information at the right time? So in this, this question around, okay, it's not, uh, if we're talking about diagnosis and diagnosis is not the only cognitive mistake that's made. So I, you know, I've really been focused on diagnosis as a presentation, but there's also testing errors. You know, you ordered a CT when you should have, should have ordered an ultrasound or you ordered the wrong lab test or you ordered the wrong therapy. All these areas, diagnosis, testing, treatment, and patient understanding can have benefit from computers and computer-based information. When you talk about diagnosis in particular, and you're asking the question about what happens if it's not a rash and it's an internal problem, they have symptoms, there still is this need to compare the features of each disease. And one of the challenges that we're looking at right now through usability testing and trying to understand how the brain works is, is how can you represent different diseases that are say internal diseases? Like the patient has abdominal pain, they might have appendicitis, they might have, a, uh, if they're older, they might have a ruptured aortic aneurysm. There are all these, it's over a hundred diagnoses that cause abdominal pain. And they don't have a rash. And they, but they have different features and different symptom patterns. Can we represent the comparison of the diseases in some way visually that's graphics, but not pictures? So we're doing a lot of research around that. Um, yeah, it's not easy. And then it's a long conversation around how you integrate these tools into the EHR so that when you're working in the EHR, it's sending you a message or giving you information and not giving you alert fatigue and not giving you too many messages. It's complicated. It's not easy. It's going to take a lot of time. It's not a, another year or two. These problems are going to go on for a long time in terms of how to create ideal computer-based information. And that's why any students that are on the call or residents that are interested in this field, this is a blue ocean for you. I mean, this is, this is gonna make or break you as a clinician. If we have good information technology, you're gonna feel like a carpenter with, with the $10,000 table saw that cuts down to a 32nd of an inch with precision. And you're gonna be proud of that table saw because you have the great tools at your hands that allows you to practice medicine at your top of your game. So we really need to have the kind of tools that doctors are proud of and when the patient comes in, the patient's going, wow, I didn't see that on Google. And you're saying, well, this is a professional tool. I've been trained in this tool. I know how to use this tool, but let me pivot my screen to you. Let me show you some of these diagrams. Let me show you your X-ray. Let me show you how you looked three months ago. Come and look at the screen with me and come and look at how the computer told me about your diagnostic possibilities and it gave me a list of these five diagnoses. And the reason I think the number two diagnosis is yours, because you match up with these symptoms and you're sharing your reasoning with the patient and the patient is seeing how elegantly you're using the tool. And now the patient has this confidence in you because you took the 30 seconds to pivot the monitor to them, point to the screen and say, this is what I'm thinking. Rather than saying, Trust me, I know what you have. I'm a doctor. I have these sheepskins on the wall that show I went to a great medical school. Trust me, I'm the expert. Well, the patient's been on Google. <laughs> the patient's been on Google for two hours before they came to see you. Why should they trust you? They just read some disinformation and they trust the disinformation. You better be armed with some tools that make you look sharp because the day of saying to the patient, you know, I went to Harvard, I went to Stanford, I had the best residency, I'm the best doctor. Those days are over. Patients don't trust you anymore. You got you to gotta show the patients you care and you got to show the patients what your thinking is and showing them the screen is actually a really positive thing. And I know that because I still see patients. And I do this all the time with my patients. I show them our thinking. 
You said that students are rewarded for memorization skills. This generation knows they can look things up quickly. They don't need to memorize everything. So what should be changed in today's medical curriculum to take advantage of their technological acumen? You mentioned informatics. Should an informatics class be required in medical school? Absolutely. I think that from the beginning of medical school, the, there should be mastery of information taught throughout medical school. How do we use information to solve problems and questions? And that should be modeled into problem-based learning. If you have a problem-based learning they, uh, case, you can have cases that are developed to, to show, well, how up-to-date could help or not help, how, how technology could work or actually go awry. Like you want, because these systems aren't perfect. They don't give you the diagnosis. And sometimes there's error. So you wanna be able to teach the students about well, what are the pitfalls? How could I get in trouble for using information technology? How could it make me shine? But really, I, I, I think that medical education has to change to understanding the path of physiology of disease and frameworks for your clinical reasoning based on path of physiology of the body. And, and you know, you have to memorize I said earlier, you know, if you're in the emergency department and you need to resuscitate a patient, you're probably not going to run to the computer to get the five steps on how to resuscitate the patient. There are certain things that you need to know right away. You need to memorize it. And you can use simulation to do that. But when you have time to think through a problem with a patient, and there's a lot of system two involved, these are the areas where computers can really help by representing the data. What, what is the patient's past medical history? What meds are they on? When were they started? What's the interplay of the past medical history with the current complaint? How thorough was I with my physical exam? How, how thorough was I with my history? The, the, Larry Weed talked about this years ago, 40 years ago, that the students are rewarded for all the wrong things. And Larry, I mean, Larry had students and residents that lived in fear of him because if you were on rounds with him and you hadn't thoroughly examined the patient and you hadn't taken a thorough history, you were eviscerated for that. You weren't, if you said you didn't know something from the books, he says, that's okay, you can read about that. But if you weren't thorough with that history and you didn't listen to the patient and you didn't examine the patient and you, you, you documented that you listened to the heart and lungs and you did it, the exam of the abdomen and you didn't really do it. You did not want to be around Larry Weed if that was the case. And so med you know, medical education, it, it's unfortunately moved away from that, from that mentors that are saying, these are the important things not the memorization of disconnected facts that are gonna be out of date in a year. You touched on this. Uh, this writer says, this is a great invention. Have you conducted any formal evaluation of Visual DX? The most interesting recent study was done at the University of Maryland around the very problem I presented in my presentation of cellulitis diagnostic error. And so what they did at the University of Maryland is they use Epic there. They, we created a custom interface, not of the entire Visual DX system, but a workup for the patient with a red body part where there's presumed cellulitis. And what they did is they got IRB approval and they randomized ER physicians in Maryland, in the University of Maryland system, to receiving a best practice advisory in EPIC or not receiving it. And so anytime that a physician went to say that patient had cellulitis, this BPA would pop up, which would be the introduction to visual DX. They had to say, click, it was the leg or the arm or the hand, and they'd answer three questions and they see the results of the differential of what they entered. And if they click bilateral, they got, a, a um, dialogue that said cellulitis is never bilateral or almost never bilateral. You need to be thinking of something else. 
And they showed that, 30, that they reduced unnecessary admissions by 38%. And they're, you know, they're writing this up and it's gone slowly because of COVID, but it's wonderful data that they have in this you know, study that they ran. There's been a bunch of studies about the effectiveness of the machine learning that we do with Visual DX. So in the mobile app, you can take a picture of the rash and the, the system helps you um, work through the evaluation of a rash or a skin lesion. And Steve Zhu, who's a dermatologist at Northwestern in Chicago, published a paper in the journal of the investigated dermatology where he, he showed that the machine learning was equally effective for skin of color. And so that was really great data because there's a lot of concern that AI is biased. And because we have um, all this imagery in skin of color, our AI is really, really pretty good for skin of color as well. What role could wearables and technology play in helping people identify disease symptoms on their own skin? Well, wearables are kind of interesting for internal symptoms in particular. So obviously the Apple Watch is sensing the body's uh, heart rhythm, also your O2 sat out of the watch now. Um, and there are efforts to you know, make blood pressure much easier through wearables and obviously glucometers. And, um, but the rash and the skin problem is more, you're taking a picture of the rash or the skin problem with the camera. And so one of the most important sensors on your phone is the camera. And you can take a picture of anything, including your skin. And so that's an area where we've created an app for patients that we're doing research on called ASA, A-Y-S-A. It's not a self-diagnosis tool. It's really a self-education tool where a patient or a parent could take a picture of a rash of themselves or a family member and get some education from it. But it doesn't, it's not really a wearable because you're taking the picture. But there's some amazing things going on. I met a physician whose background is infectious disease, tuberculosis, working overseas. They have an app that monitors your cough and they're getting big data on coughs from around the world. And so by listening, the, the phone is always on listening to, for coughs and monitoring the cough. And you can imagine, and research has shown that by using AI, you can figure out if the cough is like the cough of pertussis or a cough of TB or maybe the cough of COVID. So, you know, sensing the body and having big data on temperature, blood pressure, respirations, uh, cough, it's all really exciting, but then there's this problem of TMI and giving people information that's meaningless. So certainly you hear all the wins about the Apple Watch and the ECG, but what are all the losses of people running to their doctors for some kind of arrhythmia that was not important at all? That if you didn't monitor yourself, you would never have known you had this arrhythmia that didn't affect your health. So tech can also drive unnecessary care. Physicians have so many sources of data and are increasingly time constrained. How do you promote their use of more clinical decision support product over another, especially diff difficult for for-profit entities that aren't always trusted by MDs? Another wonderful question. I mean, it's really hard because, you know, ideally you'd love, um, you know, universities to collaborate and create these tools and maintain them. But, you know, at universities, people are always arguing with each other and things don't move very quickly. So it's companies that actually move with speed. But of course, in medicine, companies aren't really trusted. And especially if, um, you know, there's a real obvious commercial intent around it. So it's not an easy answer to say, well, what are the standards that you're looking for? You know, in our case with our company, we're physician founded. My co-founder was is Dean Emeritus of the medical school of Rochester. And we have a peer reviewed physician led editorial board 
and we employ five, five full-time medical librarians that are really skilled and we understand medicine. So I think you be wary of the 28 year old in Silicon Valley that says they're disrupting healthcare that says they're gonna do it all and they have a unicorn, and they're gonna make millions. It actually, um, doing medis medical technology to improve care is not a highly profitable business. Doing medical technology to help your hospital make more money, that's a different story. And so um, it really depends whose tools you're using and what the intent is. But I will say that, you know, our work, and we're in our 22nd year, has to do with this idea that if we're really gonna seize the power of computers to improve the care of people, which I think we are all are interested in as, as physicians, we have to do a better job of on the educational side, and we have to change the paradigm from just teaching to memorization. We, we have to design these tools so that they're really to, there to augment your decisions and you know how to use them. And we're just beginning. This is just the beginning. Uh, many of the other tools are just books that have been put online. And what you need to look for is what's the informatics architecture when you examine these tools. And so those working in the field of medical informatics know the importance of standards and vocabulary. Like, are you mapping your terminology and your medical understanding to the standard code sets such as SNOMED, which is from the College of American Pathologists or RX Norm that's supported by the National Library of Medicine? Are you mapping your medical concepts in a, in a, in a very disciplined way? Or did you just create a website? Or did you just put a book on the law? book online. There's a big, big difference between creating books, even if they're digital, and supporting digital decisions in the exam room. They're really two different beasts, the two different animals. Dr. Papir, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who asked some really, really compelling questions. I am going to hand it back over to President Langell. Thank you, Monica. Uh, thank you, as always, for your expert moderation. Dr. Papir, thank you for an outstanding presentation. We learned a great deal from you, and I think, most importantly, uh, really engaged in a, a very incredible conversation, the powerful tools that clinical decision support can give us, and the great work that you've done at Visual DX is, is, is very clear. Uh, it's transforming healthcare, and this is the future of medicine that's upon us now. Thanks so much for having me. It's really a pleasure. And we'd love to be helpful in any way we can and, and have any form of collaboration we can have with your great university. And it's all about the patient. And we share your passion of like vitals for innovation, technology, leadership. So thank you so much. Well, thank you, sir. It was, a, it was an incredible discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, Please join us for next month's Vitals, where our guest thought leader will be Dr. Ed Barksdale, Jr., Surgeon-in-Chief at University Hospitals Rainbow Babies and Children's. He is president of the American Pediatric Surgery Association and a nationally recognized leader in pediatric surgery. He's a passionate advocate for children's health care, well-known outside the operating room for his extensive work in community service and violence prevention and health disparities. Until then, be safe and be well. Health outcomes, changes due to interventions. To bring positive change, patient experiences and health must both improve. Healthcare costs must be lowered and clinician and staff burnout has to end. But our problems are big. 133 million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Half a million people are dying every year from hospital errors, injuries, and infection. The shortage of primary care professionals will be as much as 100,000 in just the next five years. Big problems require bigger solutions. Positive change needs acceleration. It needs to happen now. 
But these are not so easy solutions that many don't want to hear, and even few are willing to talk about. How to lead such a change? How to discover, discuss, and disrupt healthcare to make a difference now? This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action.